I just want to say thank you to everyone that's joining us for the Spalding New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center Knowledge in Motion program tonight. We're very excited to have you here. We also want to welcome both everyone in the room and everyone that are webcast attendees tonight. We have a lot of people here and we have over 250 webcast attendees from all over in the United States and also from around the world. And um, so I'm going to just give you, uh, we have from other countries as well, which is always very exciting. Uh, my name is Bethlyn Houlihan and I am co-director of Knowledge Translation and Dissemination for the Spalding New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center. And I would also like to mention somewhere in the room is uh, our principal investigator, Ross Safont. He's back there, but he has some things he's been taking care of. So he's uh, here, but uh, he'll be in the back for the night. Um, and um, I am just wanted to give you a sense that of tonight's program and introduce our speaker, Jen, to you. So um, Jen Coker is going to be speaking, as you can see, on complementary and integrative health care for people with spinal cord injury. And the acronym for that is CIH, so you're all in the know now. Um, Jen Coker, uh, MPH, has been a research associate at Craig Hospital since April 2012. She works primarily with the SCI model systems, which we are an SCI model system as well. She is principal investigator for the current model systems project. It's a module that's called Utilization of Complementary and Integrative Healthcare to Treat Pain in Persons with Spinal Cord Injury. And she also has a Craig H. Nielsen Foundation project called A Bridge from Rehabilitation to Real World, Reinventing Yourself After SCI. Ms. Coker has worked in the field of traumatic SCI since 1997. She obtained a Master of Public Health from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in 2001. And there she also won the James W. Alley Award for Outstanding Service to Disadvantaged Populations. Ms. Coker is currently a PhD student in the Clinical Sciences Program at the University of Colorado and Stutz, I said it wrong. <laughs> I tried. Medical campus. She has presented research at prominent national conferences and she has won several awards for her presentations and publications. So Craig Hospital is in Denver, Colorado and it's a world-renowned rehab hospital. It specializes in neural rehabilitation and the research of people with SCI and TBI. So we are very excited that she took the time to come here and be with us tonight. She'll be an excellent person for you to talk to. Uh, so please, if you have questions, make sure you make note of them so you don't forget them. And um, we can, if she's willing along the way, take questions as well. That's fine. So um, we can do that, but we'll just have to make sure that we get the microphone too if you do have something that you really need to ask um, in that moment. So thank you very much, Jen. We're very excited to have you. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak here tonight. Um, this is a very important program. Um, I'd also like to especially thank Judy for being so encouraging and helpful. Um, I hear this is her last Knowledge in Motion program, and so I'm sure she's going to be missed, but I think it's in good hands with Jenny now. Uh, so I'll acknowledge our funder first. Um, funding for the research at Craig comes from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. The same mechanism that funds the um, Spalding model system here, and it makes this education series possible. So, Bethlyn told you a little bit about me, but I'll talk about myself a little bit more. I've been involved with spinal cord injury research for 20 years now, starting first at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, and then for five years now at Craig in Denver. I've worked primarily on studies of aging after spinal cord injury disparities in outcomes, and quality of life after spinal cord injury. Uh, Beth Lynn mentioned the two studies I'm currently principal investigator for, including the one on complementary integrative health care that I'll tell you more about later. Um, we have been a spinal cord injury model system since 1974, which was the beginning of the program. And um, our current model systems research focuses on the use of statins to prevent bone loss and then the complementary integrative health care. So, there are so many different types of CIH that are out there and available, and there's information about, um, you can find stuff on the internet, late night TV, um, your hairdresser, everywhere. So, it's understandable to be, feel overwhelmed with the choices you have and not know about 
what might be helpful or what might actually be harmful. So for this presentation, I have three objectives. And my hope is by the end of this presentation, you will have learned about the many types of CIH options that are potentially helpful for people with spinal cord injury. You will have learned about previous and current clinical trials involving CIH for spinal cord injury. And you will have learned, uh, and this I think is the most important one, learned how to critically evaluate the potential usefulness of CIH for you and for your own health needs and how to approach your providers if you're interested in trying something. So what is CIH? The National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, has a fantastic website with loads of useful information. And a lot of the information I'll pre present tonight has come from their website and associated uh, resources. CIH is an all-encompassing term that includes complementary medicine, which is used together with conventional medicine, alternative medicine, which is used in place of conventional medicine, and integrative medicine, which is using complementary and alternative approaches together with conventional therapies. CIH approaches are usually separated into two types, natural products, which include herbs and nutritional supplements, and practices, which include yoga, acupuncture, and massage. Hope you all can read that. Um, so as you can see from this very crowded slide, there are a number of different types of uh, treatments, products, and practices that can be considered CIH depending on how they're used. So as you look through this list, uh, do you see anything that you may currently have used or have used in the past? Um, do anything, does anything on the list surprise you? Something, a lot of people don't think of vitamins or multivitamins as being complementary integrative healthcare, but when it's used in addition to um, conventional medicine, it is. So this list is by no means comprehensive. There are even more out there, and some of these I've never even heard of, but they're out there. So every five years, the CDC conducts the National Health Interview Survey, which is a survey of approximately 40,000 U.S. households. In 2002, 2007, and 2012, the National Health Interview Survey included questions developed by the NCCIH on complementary integrative health care use in adults in the U.S. Generally, the use of CIH has increased since 2002. And in 2012, these were the 10 most common complementary health approaches. So as you can see, the most popular one is natural products. That includes non-vitamin, non-mineral um, supplements, such as herbs, followed by deep breathing, yoga, tai chi, and I don't know how to say that other one, qigong, I think it is. Um, chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation. Uh, I do want to note here that Although they are similar, they are provided by two different types of providers who have different training, licensing, certifications. Um, and that will become important when we talk about insurance coverage later. People use meditation, massage, special diets, homeopathy, progressive relaxation, and guided imagery. So I'll present some of the key findings of the 2012 National Health Interview Survey. 33.2% of U.S. adults use complementary health approaches. This works out to about 52 million Americans. And again, the most commonly used complementary approach was natural products. Fish oil supplements, I like that little fish guy there, um, are being studied to see if they help relieve symptoms of depression, arthritis, and dry eye syndrome with the number one natural product used with 7.8% using it in 2012. Nearly 8 million more adults used fish oil in 2012 than in 2002. Use of probiotics or prebiotics, which help with a healthy gut, was four times higher in 2012 than in 2007. Melatonin use, which can help with sleep disorders and may ease mild cognitive impairment for people with Alzheimer's and ALS, more than doubled in 2012. 
And finally, use of the glucosamine chondroitin, which can help with joints, slightly decreased from 2007 to 2012, while the use of echinacea, which people use to reduce the severity of colds, and garlic, which possibly lowers blood pressure and cholesterol, decreased significantly. The mind and body practices most commonly used by adults were yoga, chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation, meditation, and massage therapy. Yoga, which can reduce pain and stress and improve overall fitness and function, was used by 9.5% of respondents. This is almost twice as many adults in the U.S. who are practicing yoga in 10 years. Chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation, like I said, they're similar but different, can provide relief from pain and was used by 8.4% of respondents. Meditation, which can reduce stress, was used by 8%. And massage, which may help with pain and improve quality of life, was used by 6.9%. However, this is a decrease from 2007, so we don't know why. I have my ideas, though. So spending, spending is a big deal. Like I said, in 2012, 59 million Americans spent a total of $30.2 billion out of pocket on CIH approaches. The out of pocket costs were 14.7 billion for practitioner visits. Let's see if this works. Right here. 12.8 billion for non-vitamin, non-mineral natural products and 2.7 billion for self-care purchases, including self-help DVDs, books, stuff like that. Most CIH appro approaches are unfortunately not covered by insurance, or if they are, it's only partially. 60% of respondents who use chiropractic care did have at least some coverage for that, but rates were much lower for acupuncture and massage. So the most common reason people seek CIH is to treat their pain. People who use spinal manipulation more often do so for treatment rather than general wellness reasons. Those who take natural products or practice yoga were more likely to do so for general wellness than for treating a specific problem. Dietary supplement users were twice as likely to report wellness rather than treatment as a reason for using it. Although, only one in four actually reported reduced stress, better sleep, or feeling better emotionally. More than 60% of adults using spinal manipulation reported doing so to treat a specific health condition, and more than 50% did so for general wellness reasons. And those, uh, those numbers are weird because there's some overlap with the questions. So like I said, yoga... Um, had the biggest bump in use. It doubled in the last 10 years. More than 85% of adults who used yoga perceived reduced stress as a, as a result of practicing. Two-thirds of yoga users reported that as a result of practicing, they were actually motivated to exercise more. And four in 10 reported they were motivated to eat better. <laughs> And yoga users were more likely to say they felt better emotionally than users of dietary supplements or spinal manipulation. There have been a number of barriers to use of CIH sorry, that have been identified. The extent of insurance coverage and prohibitive cost is the primary barrier. But other commonly reported barriers include lack of physician support, which makes it hard to talk to your doctor if you want to try something, skepticism of efficacy and safety, lack of knowledge about types of therapies available, lack of access to providers, lack of a reason to use it, and a desire for a magic bullet cure. One other interesting barrier that's been identified is that the stereotype of the typical CIH user is white, affluent, well-educated, middle-class, and female. In other words, not like me, except it's kind of just like me. <laughs> but, so the images we picture of someone doing yoga, the super bendy person on a far-off exotic beach, or someone who uses a lot of herbal medications, the aging hippie on a farm commune, doesn't always match our self-image. 
but it doesn't mean CIH isn't for you. The amount of research done on individual therapies varies widely and results have been mixed. Some trials have shown promising results that then can't be replicated. Other trials have shown that the CIH being study leads to improvements during the study, but once the person no longer has access to the CIH, those benefits go away. What good does it do if the CIH isn't available, if it's helpful? It's not available, what good is it? A search of the PubMed database on studies with the keywords complementary medicine or alternative medicine or integrative medicine yielded results from over 200,000 publications just and greater than 1,500 in just the last year. If you add spinal cord injury to that search, you get over 300 publications. So there's a lot out there. Types of CIH studied included music therapy for people with schizophrenia, ultrasound therapy for healing of venous leg ulcers, L-carnitine for cognitive enhancement, yoga for chronic low back pain, acupuncture for recovery of motor function, and many more. As pain is the most common reason for seeking alternatives to, see, uh, to traditional healthcare, it's also the most common outcome of interest in most research studies. So what does this all mean for you? According to data from the National SCI Statistical Center, in 2016, there were an estimated 282,000 persons living with SCI in the U.S., with approximately 17,000 new SCI occurring every year. When we started developing our current research on the use of CIH by people with spinal cord injury, I found a number of clinical trials of different types of CIH for secondary conditions after spinal cord injury, but they were mostly outside of the U.S., not recently done, and had very small sample sizes. Many of the clinical trials for CIH took place in China, which is not surprising given the eastern origin of a lot of the complementary integrative healthcare approaches. However, I was surprised at how little research has been done on the actual use of CIH by people with spinal cord injury. As Ross was telling me earlier, there's a good bit of information about utilization of CIH approaches by people with brain injury, but I don't know why there isn't as much for people with spinal cord injury. As I mentioned, the, there's an increasing trend towards the use of CIH, but the most recent survey of use in people with spinal cord injury was done in 2006. A different 2006 survey of CIH looked at four different types of people, or four groups of people with physical disabilities, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, arthritis, and spinal cord injury. They found that 19% of respondents had used some type of CIH at some point after their injury. The majority of people used CIH to treat pain, decreased function, and lack of energy. However, of the four groups, people with spinal cord injury reported the least use of CIH. A 2015 survey of people with spinal cord injury in Switzerland found that 74% had used some type of CIH since their injury, with acupuncture and homeopathy the most current, commonly used, and pain and urinary tract infections the most common reasons. So why do you think these uh, rates of use are so different? 74% versus, what was it, 19%? I'm thinking it probably has to do with differing healthcare systems, but who knows. So just like the general U.S. population, pain is the most common reason people with spinal cord injury seek CIH. Pain is one of the most common secondary conditions after spinal cord injury, with prevalence of pain in people with spinal cord injury ranging from 11% to 94%. This range is differing ways of measuring pain. Pain has been rated as the most, health, most important health concern, a major problem, and one of top five health concerns for people with spinal cord injury. The most recent 2006 survey that I mentioned a minute ago 
of US adults with SCI looked at reasons for or treatments used to treat pain. 73% of participants had tried at least one alternative treatment for pain since their injury. 54% had tried massage, 32% had tried cannabis, and 28% had tried acupuncture. However, only 18% reported currently using massage, with 16% and 3% currently using cannabis and acupuncture, respectively. Another study found that the most commonly tried therapies to treat pain were acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, and herbs. Satisfaction with pain release, relief was highest for massage and lowest for acupuncture. Other common secondary conditions after SCI are auto autonomic dysreflexia, bladder and bowel issues, deep vein thrombosis, respiratory issues, pressure ulcers, bone fractures, and spasticity, and CIH approaches have been studied for all of those. The current research on CIH at Craig is being done as part of the 2016 to 2021 uh, cycle of model systems funding. And it's also gonna be my dissertation research. Um, there are four other model systems also participating in the study. Uh, the model systems here at Spalding, so thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tier Memorial Herman in Houston, Kessler Rehab in New Jersey, and the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago. If any of you attending tonight or on the webcast are part of those model systems, you may be approached to respond to my survey, so I hope you choose to do that. And eventually, we'll hopefully get it out to a wider audience. The current study was initiated based on two reasons. In 2015, the Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center conducted a survey to identify topics for fact sheets. Responses to the survey indicated a strong desire for a fact sheet on access to alternative therapies. Also, anecdotally, we have a high number of patients in our outpatient clinic who are seeking alternative to pain medications and other medications and are asking how to access CIH to treat pain. A high proportion of patient-directed self-treatment using alternatives to pain medications speaks to a significant area of need and we need and more understanding to be able to provide those answers. We feel it's important to understand the scope of CIH use in people with spinal cord injury in order to improve medical management, including pain treatment and other long-term outcomes. Our study, which will include over 400 participants, which is four times as big as the, other, the most recent study, will help gain a current and comprehensive understanding of the needs in this area for people with spinal cord injury. What types of CIH are people using? What specific health reasons are they using it for? And are the treatments actually helpful? If you haven't tried CIH, why not? Is it a lack of access? Lack of trust? Are doctors not prescribing or suggesting other options? Or is CIH viewed as some new age, hippy dippy weird medicine that doesn't work for people with spinal cord injury? The goal of the project, again, is to provide comprehensive information. The implications of the research range from facilitating new ideas to developing clinical trials on CIH that people are actually using and finding useful and to helping affect policy change on access to CH, CIH. The ultimate goal is to expand our knowledge in this newly evolving field to contribute to further improving health and quality of life for people with spinal cord injury. So, we're in the process of updating our knowledge of what CIH approaches people with spinal cord injury are actually using or not. But I know you're all interested in what has been and is currently being studied. There is a lot of information out there. And uh, the, the, the inform they, they do studies on things that may be helpful, may not be helpful, may be dangerous, may not be dangerous. So one of the tools we use as researchers are systematic reviews. Systematic reviews 
are papers that summarize all the research being done on one a research question. I did a quick Google Scholar search. I already knew the answer to this, but for the purposes of this, I did a quick Google Scholar search, and I found that there are a number of systematic reviews of CIH approaches for certain disability groups, including asthma, cancer, irritable bowel syndrome, multiple sclerosis, and osteoarthritis, but there is not a systematic review targeted for spinal cord injury. However, um, as Beth Lynn mentioned, she's the KT coordinator here, something like that. So model systems research, uh, researchers in conjunction with the Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center is working on building a systematic review of CIH approaches. Now this is, it's a long process, so it'll take us a while, but we're working on it. And I do want to add a disclaimer. All of this information I'm going to tell you is what's out there. Just because it's been studied, just because there have been positive results, does not necessarily mean it works. As I said earlier, results are mixed, and more long-term research is needed for all of these. And later on, I'll give you some tips for critically evaluating any research you find or websites you find that have information. So a number of natural products have been studied in people with spinal cord injury. A study in China of newly injured persons who took the herbal medicine DHYZ in addition to their rehabilitation therapy had more improvements in sensory and motor function than those who did not take DHYZ while undergoing rehab. Ginkgo biloba and Chinese skullcap are two herbs which may have neuroprotective effects. A number of nutritional approaches have been studied in regards to bladder health. Obviously, cranberry juice and cranberry pills have been studied for a while. They've been found to be helpful in preventing UTIs. Several herbs, including bearberry, horsetail, and marshmallow root, have also been studied in regards to bladder health. Several vitamins and minerals may have useful applications for people with spinal cord injury. Vitamin D and calcium are recommended to prevent bone loss. Everybody drink your milk. <laughs> and vitamin E can also be neuroprotective. Many practices have also been studied. There is extensive literature available on the benefits of acupuncture. Um, it can help with functional recovery bladder dysfunction and pain relief, electroacupuncture, which is acupuncture with electric pulses attached to the needles, has also been shown to improve both bowel and bladder function. Biofeedback can be helpful with promoting functional recovery. Electromagnetic therapies have been found to improve sensory and motor recovery, accelerate the healing of pressure ulcers, improve respiration and airway clearance, help with bowel and bladder function, and has potential for helping to prevent deep venous thrombosis. Functional electrical stimulation-assisted exercises, such as the FES rowing that we have here, um, have been shown to be a valuable tool in assisting to, with functional recovery, with potential benefits such as improved venous return from lower limbs, prevention of bone loss, fewer urinary tract infections, muscle mass retention, and cardiovascular health, as well as the psychological benefits that occur when you have improved health and greater independence. Massage has been studied a lot. It's been shown to improve bowel function, reduce pain, depression, and anxiety, and increase flexibility and range of motion. Healing touch is a special kind of massage therapy. And it can accelerate wound healing and reduce pain, of course. Chiropractic treatments and manual therapy have also shown similar reductions in pain. Relaxation therapy techniques can be helpful for reducing emotional distress, distress and improving ability to cope during inpatient rehab. And finally, sitting Tai Chi has been shown to improve sitting balance. 
Like the majority of CIH research in the general population, most of the research that has been done on CIH for people with spinal cord injury has focused on alternatives to opioids for the treatment of pain. CIH that has been found to be effective in treating chronic pain includes acupuncture, biofeedback, chiropractic manipulation, herbs, minerals, and vitamin supplements, specifically fish oil, glucosamine, chondroitin, and vitamin D, hypnosis, massage, and healing touch, relaxation training, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, and yoga and tai chi. Again, there have been mixed results for all of these approaches. So, if you think back to that list I showed you earlier on in the presentation with all the different types, you probably noticed that the first one on the products list was cannabis. And I promise that was just because it's alphabetical order. So with the number of states legalizing medical and or recreational use of marijuana, I think we're up to 20 states now that have some sort of regulation, including Colorado and Massachusetts. I know many of you are probably interested on research that's been done in this area. I will first note that at Craig Hospital, we do not condone, support, recommend, or prescribe marijuana for use in our SCI and TBI patients. That said, cannabis has been used for medicinal purposes for a very long time, with the first noted medicinal use in China in 2737 BC. However, it's still listed as a Schedule I substance under the Controlled Substances Act, so it remains illegal at the federal level, which limits research that we can do on cannabis. In January of 2017, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine published a 468-page report titled The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, the Current State of Evidence and Recommendations for Research. This report summarizes the health effects of marijuana and, produce, and products derived from it and the current evidence on therapeutic and harmful effects. It also recommends that research be done to develop a more comprehensive understanding of the health effects of marijuana and gives suggestion on ways to overcome the legal barriers that make it difficult to do so because it is still illegal at the federal level. There was only one conclusion that was specific to spinal cord injury, and it was there is insufficient or no evidence to support or refute the conclusion that cannabis or cannabinoids are an effective treatment for symptoms of spasticity in patients with paralysis due to spinal cord injury. So, what does that mean? <laughs> there's, there's no evidence to support or refute it. Take it as you will. There is an excellent presentation online that's available called The Use of Medical Marijuana to Manage Symptom Burden in Spinal Cord Injury. That was from the 2014 Spinal Cord Injury Wellness Center. Um, I have that link in your list of resources. It's really good. In the presentation, Dr. Gregory Carter discusses the history of medical cannabis use in the U.S., the physiological effects of cannabis, and current scientific evidence, at least current in 2014, regarding the safety and effectiveness of cannabis as a treatment for neuropathic pain. Some of the benefits noted in the presentation were pain relief, relief from muscle spasms, and also he noted that cannabinoids can actually enhance the effects of antispasticity medications. But of course, the report found no evidence to support or refute. Who knows? Cannabis is generally safe and well tolerated, generally doesn't cause constipation like opioids do, and can actually have a weekly stimulatory effect on the gut and it generally doesn't suppress breathing like opioids do. However, he does note that cannabis may not be for everybody, can also cause disorganized thoughts, confusion, agitation, and paranoia. It can impair your balance and stability, which is important, especially if you're ambulatory, and then can affect memory, judgment, and motor skills. At Craig, we recently completed an anonymous survey of cannabis use in our patients with spinal cord injury and brain injury. This survey asked about pre and post 
cannabis use, reasons for using cannabis, method of use, frequency of use, and any side effects, any negative side effects that may have been experienced. We're still analyzing this data, and they wouldn't let me have any to tease you with, so just have to keep your eyes open for that. So I have given you all a lot of information, and now I'm going to tell you about some resources if you're considering using something, a CIH approach for your health. The NCCIH provides a lot of information on this on their website. Um, the first tip is to be an educated consumer. Find out and consider what studies have been done on the safety and effectiveness of any CIH approach that's of interest to you. The best source to find current and past clinical trials on any given approach is clinicaltrials.gov. You want to learn about factors that will affect your safety. So if this is a practice that's, uh, that you go see a, pro a provider or practitioner for, you want to find out about their licensing, their certification, their training, their education. Do they know what they're doing? For a product such as a dietary supplement, safety factors include the specific ingredients, the quality of the manufacturing process, and keep in mind that natural doesn't always mean safe. The NCCIH actually provides information on the safety of a lot of supplements and practices on their website. Be aware that individuals respond differently to health products and practices, whether conventional or complementary. How you might respond to one depends on many things, including your current state of health, how you use it, and what you believe about it. Discuss the information and your interest with your healthcare providers before making any decisions. And before, and especially before using any dietary supplement, make sure that there won't be any side effects or drug interactions with medications you're currently taking. So you've decided, you've found something you want to try. Now you need to find a provider. And you want to choose your complementary health provider just as carefully as you would choose a conventional health provider. If you need names of practitioners in your area, first check with your doctors. They may know someone, nearby hospital or medical schools, professional organizations, regulatory agencies or licensing boards, or even your health insurance company may have recommendations. Find out as much as you can about any potential practitioner, including education, training, licensing, certifications. Credentials required for complementary health practitioners vary widely from state to state, what they can provide, what they can't provide. And that also varies from discipline to discipline. Find out whether the practitioner is willing to work together with your conventional health providers uh, to coordinate care. It's important for all of the professionals involved in your health to communicate and cooperate. Explain all of your conditions to the, health, the practitioner and find out about their training and experience in working with people with spinal cord injury specifically. Choose a practitioner who understands how to work with your specific health needs, even if general well-being well is your goal. And remember that health conditions that you have can affect the safety of some practices. For instance, if you have glaucoma, there are certain yoga positions that are not recommended. The big one, don't assume your health insurance will cover practitioner services. Contact them and ask. Insurance plans differ greatly in what complementary services, health approaches they cover, and even if they cover a particular approach, there may be restrictions. For instance, I was talking to you about the difference between chiropractic and osteopathic manipulation. Similar procedures, my insurance will not cover chiropractic, but it will cover osteopathic manipulation. So it's things like that that you need to find out. 
And finally, tell all your healthcare providers what you're doing. Make sure your conventional doctor knows you're trying a complementary approach so that you can stay safe. So another awesome resource, and I, I've known about the Chanda Plan Foundation for a long time. I don't know if, if it's made its way out here or not. But the mission of the Chanda Plan Foundation is to provide access to alternative treatments via location-based and provider-based facilities in Colorado and across the nation with the goal of lowering health care costs and improving health outcomes for people with physical disabilities who rely on Medicaid. So what they've done, and I knew about this part, but I didn't know about the nationwide part. So in Colorado, they've created a project called the SCI waiver. So for eight years, started in 2012, it'll go to 2020, Colorado Medicaid is covering um, acupuncture, massage, and chiropractic care for people who qualify. And we are evaluating the data. And if the project is successful, like we think it will be, in improving health outcomes and lowering costs, we'll hopefully take it nationwide. The top priority for the Chanda Plan Foundation is to be able to provide funding for integrative health services to people with physical, physical disabilities. We provide acupuncture, massage, yoga, chiropractic care, and behavioral health services locally. However, and this was new to me, funding is offered nationwide for adaptive exercise, acupuncture, massage, chiropractic care, and adaptive yoga through their extensive network of providers. There, is an, there are eligibility requirements and there is an application process, um, but it's a fantastic resource. And the link for eligibility information and the applications is in your handouts. Okay, so how to evaluate online resources. There's a lot of information out there on the web. Not all of it is very good. There are five questions you can ask yourself when you find a website that talks about something that sounds promising to you. Who runs the website? Can you trust them? Any reliable health-related website should make it easier, easy for you to know who's responsible for the content. Um, you can also learn about who runs the website by looking at the letters in the extension. For in instance, .gov means it's a government website. You can generally trust those. Uh, EDU indicates, <laughs> generally, <laughs> um, EDU indicates it's a educational organization. Generally, educational institutions have reliable information. However, if it's someone's personal page through that institution, may not necessarily have reliable information. .org are non-commercial, non-profit organizations, and .com are commercial organizations. So just because there's a .org and the address doesn't mean it's, it's reliable and they're not trying to sell you something. Sometimes uh, they have phony websites set up to mislead consumers and they talk about, you know, this is great, and oh, you have to buy it. So just do your research. So what does the site say? Do the claims seem too good to be true? There is no magic pill out there that's going to cure everything for six monthly payments of $29.99. It just doesn't exist. Um, the purpose of the site is related to who is paying for it. There should be a clear statement of purpose somewhere on the website, usually in an About Us section. To be sure you're getting reliable information, you should confirm any information that you find on sites that are selling something by checking sites that are not trying to sell a product. Where did the information come from? Is it based on scientific research? Or is it opinions? In addition to identifying the source of the information you're reading, the site should des describe the evidence 
such as articles in medical journals, that the material is based on. Opinions and advice should be clearly set apart from scientific evidence-based information. For example, if a site discusses health benefits that people can expect from a treatment, look for references to scientific research that clearly support what's said, and keep in mind that testimonials, opinions, unsupported claims are not the same as evidence-based information. When was the information posted or reviewed? How up-to-date is it? Some types of outdated medical information can be misleading and obviously dangerous. Responsible health websites review and update much of their content on a regular basis, especially information content such as fact sheets and newsletters. However, some content such as news reports or presentations like this webcast are only going to be as current as they are when they're presented. So keep that in mind. If you find an awesome presentation from 1996, might have been awesome in 1996, but not so much now. You can always find a date somewhere on the website. Usually it's on the bottom of the page or underneath the author's name. And finally, why does the site exist? Are they trying to sell you something? Again, likely if they're trying to sell you something, then the site is run by the people that are trying to make money. Their evidence may not necessarily be evidence because they want to sell you a product or a practice or something. So the key takeaway from all of that information is just talk to your doctors. If you are interested in trying an approach, go talk to your doctors. They're the ones that know you the best, and they should be willing to talk to you about different options. You know, because there's stuff out on the web, there's social media, you know, your cousin Bob's sister's hairdresser might have heard of this fantastic pill that will help you, but talk to your doctors. So I have um, the next few slides are a list of resources that can be found on the web. They're also in your handouts, I believe. So again, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health is probably the best source of information. They have on their website, they have a health topics A to Z, um, which lists healthcare needs and different types of CIH approaches. They are also on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest, which I think is kind of weird. But. Um, the NCCIH also provides that guide, six things to know when choosing a CIH practitioner. I think that's in your handout. And the guide to finding and evaluating online resources that I talked about. Clinicaltrials.gov. This is the best source to find current, past, research on different approaches. As you can see, they have an excellent, easy to use search menu. You put in your condition, so spinal cord injury or spinal cord injuries. And then in the other terms, put in the CIH approach that you're interested in. I chose biofeedback for this. And as you can see, it found six studies. You can also limit it to a certain state or some country. So there's six, six studies that have been done on biofeedback for people with spinal cord injury. Also, on this search result, you can, so you can click on the study title and it'll take you to more information you'll ever want to know about a research study. But in the intervention section, you can kind of look at what they are look, studying in the study. So for example, the fifth study, they're looking, they're comparing the therapeutic effects of the music glove, which kind of sounds interesting, to conventional hand exercise. And you can also see the status if they're not yet recruiting, if the study is completed, um, active but not recruiting, and unknown. Craig Hospital provides a great overview of complementary and integrative health approaches for people with spinal cord injury. I think that's in your handouts too. I can't remember what I sent Judy. <laughs> I don't know a lot of stuff. 
And then the Spinal Cord Injury Model System Information Network also provides an overview. The Paralyzed Veterans of America provide a comprehensive overview of CIH therapies that have been used and studied, as well as the Icelandic Health Authorities and World Health Organization. Um, they maintain a site on new and emerging therapies for spinal cord injury, and this site actually covers more than just complementary and integrative healthcare approaches. It covers stem cell research and other stuff like that. There's the Chanda Plan uh, Foundation website, eligibility information and applications for those uh, nationwide services that I was telling you about. The next deadline is November 9th. So there's time. Go fill out the application. I think it's a $10,000 lifetime cap on services that they will fund. So if you have time and want to read a 468-page, very boring report, the uh, health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids is available for free online. Um, and the presentation that I was telling you about, the use of medical marijuana to manage symptom burden, is also available free online. It's about an hour-long presentation, but it's really interesting. And I'll finally, I'll leave you with a couple of fun things. The Christopher and Dana Ree Foundation has a series of adaptive yoga videos that are available for free on YouTube. And Disabled Sports USA provides some basic adaptive Tai Chi movements. Okay, I just threw a lot of information at y'all. So, <laughs> hit me with questions. I'll try my best to answer them, but remember, your provider, your normal doctors are the best ones to ask. So. Wait for a microphone. Coming. Coming. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to keep up with a little bit of the research, and uh, I saw a study recently where they actually tried to do a controlled study on cranberry and found that it was very non didn't seem to make any difference. And uh, it wasn't spinal cord, but it was like a double blind study on nursing home patients where they said they were living into the same conditions and they're eating the same diet and some of them got uh, and they had an objective set of standards for what constituted a UTI and they basically found the same incidence rate in people who were getting cranberry supplements and people who were getting a placebo. Uh, so that one seemed to me to say maybe save the money on spend it on something else rather than cranberry. Well, that's, that's where the mixed results from research studies come in. There have been studies that have found that cranberry juice, pills, they've tested different types of, of taking it. There have been studies that have found it is helpful. There have been studies that found it's not helpful. They can't, that's, and, and I think part of that is due to the differing ways that you can take, you, do you drink the juice, do you take the pills? all of the above, and also one of the things we were talking about earlier is different formulations. You know, how much cranberry, whatever the magic is in cranberries, how much are you actually getting if you buy this bottle of supplements versus drinking cranberry juice? Yeah. Well, I know that what they were saying, at least, and again, take the research for what it's worth, uh, is that then they did their survey of existing research. What they had found was that they... Uh, studies that claim to have benefits were not always as well controlled in terms of, you know, placebo versus real effect or whatever, uh, and a lot of it was self-reporting. So they were, th this was like the first one I saw that was actually doing something that looked like a scientific method. Yeah, exactly. That's, there, there's always that risk with clinical trials. Other questions? There. Thank you. I just wanted to put out every morning I have cranberries. I buy them in season and freeze them all year. And every morning in my nuts and seeds, I have fresh cranberries. That's the way to go. Fresh cranberries, everybody. Skip the pills, skip the juice. We have a question back here. Hi, Jennifer. I don't have a question, I have a comment. Uh, I'm an alumnus of Craig Hospital, 
and you've probably gotten to know the language being at Craig for four years, so anybody who's successfully completed rehab there are called alumni. I was there in December 1974 to March 1975. So Craig Hospital has followed me along all of these 42 years, and the benefits have been enormous. As you know, and as people here may know, and I'd like to tell them if they don't, that Craig Hospital is a world-renowned spinal cord rehab, the leading researcher in the spinal cord injury in the United States. And done in, not only do they do intensive physical therapy and occupational therapy, but the emphasis is on intensive education. So when I was a teenager in high school injured, I didn't want to hear about SP tubes and leg bags and so on and so forth and how to prevent pressure sores. But I must tell you that 42 years post-injury, I only had one pressure sore, and I've been pressure sore free since then because I'm on the proper seat cushion. But they have followed me along all these many years. And Dr. Robert Mentor, I don't know, you may have heard of him. I don't know if you ever met him. He retired in 2006. He was my doctor. He was only four years into his career when I met him in 1974. And I just want to commend you for being the new generation of people at Craig Hospital who will be leading their wonderful mission uh, to help people live. They had never promised a cure, like the Miami Project said. And I'm only saying that because Dr. Mentor and Dr. LaMercy had said that for many years where the Miami Projects were being set up in the early 1980s, they were able to, well, of course, because they had a lot of people who knew Dick Bonacani, bring in millions of dollars, which Craig wished they could have done, but they never promised a cure, Craig, and they still don't, but they teach you and educate you how to live with a life-altering injury or traumatic brain injury. I just have one funny uh, anecdote to tell you. You have to remember the times. You probably weren't maybe born in 1974, 75, maybe you were small, but those baby boomers sitting here today, when you were talking about cannabis and marijuana, medical marijuana, I'm not surprised that Craig doesn't condone it uh, or the use of it or prescribe it. But what I want to tell you is a funny anecdote. In 1975, one month after I was discharged, the Vietnam War ended with the fall of Saigon. So you, that just gives a perspective to everybody where we were in the 1970s. But at that time, the rehab techs, uh, and we were allowed to do this, not myself, they would take the older fellows out, the ones in their 20s and 30s, and they would smoke marijuana outside. And that was condoned and that was allowed, but that was, the, that was the era. And I know that's not true today, but I just thought you'd appreciate my story that, and, uh, that Craig did this fantastic job. Even then, and they're still doing a fantastic job. They, as I said, have followed me along all these many years. So I commend you and also uh, to thank you for traveling 2,700 miles from Denver and coming out here to Craig House. And Craig, by the way, is in Englewood, yes. suburb of Denver. Yes. <laughs> I, I say Denver because nobody's ever heard of Englewood. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've heard some really great stories about the good old days at Craig. I won't repeat them. Some of them I wish I'd never heard. <laughs> we got a question over there, Jim. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if there's been any um, studies or anything with yoga on um, for people with quadriplegia, like limited arm motion. Does it help? Does it work? Can it be done? I don't know if there have been specific studies for arm movement, but there have been studies done that show it can help decrease lower back pain specifically, and it also helps with range of motion and flexibility. Hi. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm like... <laughs> feel like a stand-up comedian, don't you? So uh, there's some of the resources that you had available that show the different studies. Um, is there information on whether or not they've been peer reviewed and how those reviews have gone? All of the information that I reported has is from peer reviewed journals. It doesn't it still doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. Um, one of the problems with the clinical trials and I may have mentioned this before, but a lot of times we're doing these studies, people are receiving whatever the service is, and they're receiving benefits of it while they're in the study. However, when the study's over and they no longer have access, those benefits fall off. So that's one of the reasons why we want to develop bigger clinical trials, longer lasting clinical trials, and follow people for a long time, because if we can say, People who receive, let's say, massage, people who are able to get regular massage over a long-term period have better health outcomes. 
costing less money for, you know, costing the insurance companies less money. So in the hopes that the insurance companies will start paying for those services instead of all the other consequences. Other questions? I am the, the eternal optimist. Roseanne's coming to you, Al. Oh, hi. Hi, Roseanne. So I was wondering what DHYZ is. I didn't oh, hear that before. I knew somebody was going to ask me that. Hold on. I don't know if I can pronounce it. You get the prize for asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to say D Wang Yen Z. The D H Y Z is much easier. <laughs> About you know you know. No idea. It's I think it's a combination of a bunch of different herbs. We can we can Google it. <laughs> Question the the Chanda Plan Foundation. Can you go in a little more detail what that that foundation is and? Sure. So Chanda Hinton Lykel is the founder of the Chanda Plan Foundation. She was, um, she was shot when she was nine years old, I believe. And as she puts it, there's a great video out there, and I, I thought about including a clip, but um, there's a great video out there where she talks about waking up in the hospital one day. She weighed 84 pounds. This was, she was in her 20s by this point. She weighed 84 pounds, and she was absolutely miserable. And the doctors would give her all the pain meds she wanted. But they wouldn't pay for her to go get massages, to go get chiropractor. And so um, she and her sister somehow um, gained access to these services, and it changed her life. She became healthier, happier. And so she decided she wanted to create the Chanda Plan Foundation in order to provide these services to other people because she thinks it's that important. Um, so locally, the Chanda Plan Foundation has the Chanda Center for Health, and people can come in and receive services for free. The chiropractic, massage, yo adaptive yoga, adaptive exercise, acupuncture, um, probably a couple, and behavioral health services as well. And like I told you about the SCI waiver project, they started that in 2012 because Chanda really believes that having access to these services will lower health care costs for Medicaid. And they somehow, she's very persuasive, obviously. She talked Colorado Medicaid into agreeing to cover these services for people with spinal cord injury under Medicaid. So... They are pilot testing this for the eight years. 2020 is when the pilot project ends. And we're collecting data and analyzing the data on low, you know, better health outcomes, less use of opioid drug medication, and lower costs for Medicaid. Colorado for this. For this pilot project, it's only in Colorado. But, of course, the implications, if it does lower costs for Colorado Medicaid, then other states can use her plan to hopefully get their state to pilot test it or just initiate it. Local Colorado. Other questions? Jen, I do have one question. I was thinking it's a lot of information, lots of different things to wade through as far as does it work, does it not work, what do I do? Um, is there anything that really rises to the top? Is there pretty clear evidence that there is benefit from X? There has been a lot of research on acupuncture, um, which I know acupuncture can be very scary. It's needles, but it's not nearly as bad as you would think. But there is, a, there is actually a systematic review of actu acupuncture studies for people with spinal cord injury that does exist. So the evidence is pretty good for 
the benefits of acupuncture. And if you know anything about acupuncture, and, and I don't know a lot, but they put the needles in specific parts of your body that target other health systems and parts of your body. So acupuncture can affect your whole body system. So I think, you know, there have been evidence of benefits for bowel and bladder health, for pain reduction. I think there was one study that it promoted functional recovery. People who received acupuncture during inpatient rehab recovered more function than people who didn't. Um, and I can't remember the other ones. But ac acupuncture probably stands out in my mind the most. It's, it, at least it's been studied the most. One more question. Uh, so electrical, electro acupuncture, what is that? So electro, it's, it's, it's just how it sounds. You have the acupuncture needles that are placed in specific body parts, and then they attach an electrode to it and send electrical pulses into the needle, into your body. And it's just, it, it adds additional stimulation. Stim? stim? Uh, similar to that, but um, a little different. It's not, the, the FES is a lot stronger than the electroacupuncture. Okay, thank you. Well, um, let's give Jen a round for coming in to be with us. <laughs> thank y'all. I'm going to close us out tonight, so I'm going to take your spot. <laughs> So um, let me just uh, get my notes for, so I just want to thank everybody that's here tonight. It's always awesome to see full room, to see all the, the faces uh, and get to talk to people. Um, and so um, I do want to also thank the many webcasters who have joined us. We're always very appreciative to have people that are able to uh, be a part of this from near and far and still be very close to the, and live with the event. And it will be recorded and put on our website as well. Um, and we are going to have our next lecture on October 19th. And we'd love for you to join us. We're still um, considering exactly what the topic's going to be. The last thing I just want to say is I want to take a moment to let everyone know Judy Zazula will be leaving us as of um, June 28th. And while we understand that she must go to take care of herself right now, she will be deeply missed by all the team and the whole SEI community. Uh, her tireless devotion and her advocacy over the 35 plus years for people with SEI is unparalleled and deeply inspiring. So uh, I gotta say that this, this lecture would not be anywhere near as successful or meaningful without her and all that she's done and, and with so many of the things that we, we've done as a model system. Uh, we've been very lucky to have her with us here in Boston. So, <laughs> please join us in wishing her all the best. And we have in the back just a, a sign that um, it's just a, a little, uh, board that people could sign with a permanent marker if you'd like to send her, give her your wishes, and there are people there that can also help with that if you would like them to help. Thank you, everybody, very much. And thank you, Judy. <laughs>